Good morning. My name is apparently Zach, but you can call me Azzy. I was watching some God of War 4 gameplay recently and began having an internal argument over the size of that giant slither belt surrounding the Viking world when I realized I know jack shiz about Norse mythology. We all can quote Greek and Roman gods' life stories better than we can remember what we all had for breakfast yesterday, thanks to Disney romanticizing it in modern culture. But them baddies from up north, we know names, and that Tom Hiddleston is an adorable Loki, but that's about it. So I did some research, emphasis on the word some, and made this handy-dandy guide that I have lovingly titled Norse Mythology for Dum-Dums. Disclaimer. I wrote this to be a humorous oversimplification of Norse mythology, and if taken at face value, will lose much of the finer details. I will also note that I am barely proficient in English, my first and only language, so I will 1000% be butchering most of the names I found. I apologize in advance as profusely as I can, so I don't spend the next half hour doing nothing but face planting my brains out trying not to offend. Good? Awesome. On with the show. In the beginning, there were only two realms. Niflheim, the realm of mist and ice, and Muspelheim, the realm of fire. Sitting between them was the void, called Ginnungagap, where the heat and cold mixed to form steam, which collected and eventually formed Ymir, the first Jotun also commonly referred to as giants, but think of them as similar to the titans from Greek and Roman mythology, as in gods and parents of gods. And Adhumla, the first cow. Be forewarned. Like all mythologies, this stuff gets weird. With just a Jotun and a cow in all of everything, stuck between a stove and a freezer, existence was pretty boring. So time was spent with Ymir drinking milk, Yes, that milk. And Adhumla licking a salt block made from melting rime from Niflheim, which she licked into the shape of a man. This salty dude, being mythology and all, came to life as Buri, the first Aesir. Think similar to the Olympians of Greek and Roman mythology, like Big Daddy Zeus and Hades and Poseidon. Uh, now, we can't have some old school mythology without some down to Midgar, we'll get there, uh, violence. Spoiler alert, Buri offs Ymir and uses his corpse to create the universe. Simple, right? So now we have the whole of creation being created. Let's set the stage and call in our actors. But pay attention, because this is where things start to get complicated. The Norse mythologic universe consists of nine worlds or realms, and the exact placement of each realm in relation to each other is rarely specified without being contradicted in some way. There are, however, some pretty jo solid general guidelines on locations, so we'll go with that. The top section consists of Asgard, which is home of the Aesir, and it's prosperous and well defended, for now. Epic foreshadowing. Vanaheim, which is home of the Vanir, or second-tier gods just under the Aesir, it's beautiful and full of light. And they had a brief war with Asgard, but that came to an end, and now an exchange program happened. Honir and Mimir, or Aesir, came down to Vanaheim, and Freyr and Freya, or Vanir, went up to Asgard. And then Alfheim, home of the Bright Elves, or Losothar, a land and people just too dang beautiful. This whole realm was given to Freyr by the Aesir when he lost his first tooth. Tooth fairy leaving me just a couple of dollars, but giving this dude an entire realm and people. The middle section consists of Jotunheim, which is home to the ice and mountain Jotun, a never-ending winter covering mountains and forests. The Jotun and the Aesir don't really get along, so lots of fighting happens both here and back in Asgard. Jotunheim is a representation of the winters that the Norse people would have to face. Midgard, which is home of the humans, also known as Middle-earth, and I wonder where Tolkien got that idea from. Midgard is halfway between Jotunheim and Asgard, and is supposedly isolated from both, with humans being neither the perfect beings, like the Aesir, 
insert eye roll here, nor monstrous like the Jotun, snort of derision, thus allowing humans the freedom to become whichever they choose. Free will initiated. Svartalheim, which is home of the Dark Elves, or Mirkulfar, living in an entirely subterranean realm, the Dark Elves were really good at crafting and mining and made the best stuff for the gods. Are we sure we're talking about elves here? Nidavilar, or home of the dwarves, this might have been part of or another name for Svartalheim, or it could have been another realm altogether. There's not really a ton of surviving lore to go on for either of these two sections or realms. Figured out. The bottom section consists of Hell, H E L, home of those who died of illness or of old age, and guarded by the entity of the same name. In Norse belief, if you died in battle, you either get carted off to the halls of Valhalla or the garden of Folkvagner in Asgard. If you drown, you hang out with the sea goddess Ran. But everything else gets you a trip to hell. This isn't the Christian hell of fire and brimstone, but instead is a damp and cold and depressing land. I feel like there really isn't a good ending in any of this. Brutal death and a 50 50 on a brutal round two, or just a guarantee on depressing afterlife. Spoiler alert Ragnarok brutally rekills even the dead, so everyone's screwed. Niflheim, which is technically a part of hell, which is home of the disgraced dead, permanent ice and night, and the souls of people who suck. Count me out. And Muspelheim, which is home of the fire Jotun and guarded by the Jotun Surtur, uh, a place of fire, toxic fumes, rivers of venom, and an all around nasty place. During Ragnarok, again, we'll get there. Surtur's going to destroy everything. So enjoy the apocalypse. All right, let's get down to the family tree. Now let me forewarn you again, this stuff gets weird. I'm going to keep things super brief, and this is just the introduction of the characters and not their therapy sessions with Dr. Azzy. I'll state their name as best I can. Their general race, I'm a lump all Aesir and Vanir together as gods because I'm lazy. And then a quick little blurb about them. There are a few, so I'll try to be quick. Emir, Jotun, the father of all Jotun, killed by Buri, and his body makes up seven of the nine realms. At Homla, primeval super cow, mother of Buri, licked a salt rock until it came to life and killed her main companion. Brutal. Arbodi, Jotun, son of Emir, father of Loki, husband of Lofi. Name meaning dangerous striker or sudden striker. Possibly inspired by lightning strike caused wildfires. Lofi. Jotun. Daughter of Emir, mother of Loki, wife of Farbodi. Also called Nal. It is stated that she is skinny and frail. She's as thin as a Nal. Igir. Jotun. Son of Emir, husband of Ran. Grandfather of Heimdall male personification of the sea and associated with brewing ale. Ran, Jotun, daughter of Emir, wife of Aegir, grandmother of Heimdall, female personification of the sea and associated with a net. Uri, god, father of Bor, grandfather of Odin, the first Aesir, but his story stops after he brings about his son. Uh, whether he lives, died, or became a snake-infested cupcake, no one knows. Angerboda. Jotun. Daughter of Amir. Slept with Loki. Mother of monsters. She did the dirty and popped out Fenrir, Jormungand, and Hell. Wait till you hear about Loki's other kid. Loki. Jotun. 
son of Farbodi and Lofi, slept with Angerboda and a horse. Yeah. Father of nothing normal. I know at this point, you only care about the horse thing. Yeah, he slept with a horse. Uh, long story short, he transformed himself into a female horse, got knocked up, and birthed out an eight-legged mount for Daddy Odin named Sletnir. Enjoy adding that to your Google search history. Angeya, Atla, Estelia, Ergyafa, Gelp, Grape, Imther, and Ulfrin. They're all Jotun. Uh, they're the not, they're eight of the nine daughters of Aegir and Ren, uh, and they're the mothers of Heimdall. They're the personification of the waves. There was no father. Besla, Jotun, wife of Bor, mother of Odin and others, uh, sister of Mimir. Pretty much all we know about her is her relations. Bor, Jotun, son of Buri, husband of Besla, father of Odin and others. Same issue with Besla. Very little is known about Bor. Fjorgen, masculine personification of the earth. Father of Frigg, grandfather of Balder. Might be the male version of Thor's mom, Jord. Think shape-shifting or being both sexes and either sex at once. Did I say mythology is weird? Fenrir, Loki spawn. Child of Angerboda and Loki. Will kill Odin at Ragnarok, then die to Thor's half-brother, Vithar. Jormungand, Loki spawn, child of Angerboda and Loki, gigantimous sea serpent within the great ocean that encircles Midgard, biting its own tail like an Ouroboros, Jormungand and Thor will kill each other at Ragnarok. Hel, Loki spawn, child of Angerboda and Loki, oversees the land of the dead and will sail to Ragnarok with her army of the dishonorable dead against the Aesir. Slepnir, Loki spawn, child of a horse and Loki, eight-legged horse which Odin uses as his mount. Yord, feminine personification of the earth, slept with Odin, mother of Thor. It's hinted that she might be a Jotun, but never explicitly stated. Heimdall, god. Son of nine sisters, grandson of Aegir and Ran. Vigilantly guards the Bifrost, the rainbow bridge that connects Midgard to Asgard, just waiting for the enemy to poke their head around a corner, like the sweatiest of campers. Honor, god. Son of Besla and Bor, brother of Odin. Never heard of this brother of Odin? No one has. Let's move on. Odin, god. Son of Besla and Bor, slept with Jord, husband of Frigg, stepfather of Loki, father of Thor and others. We know enough about Odin from pop culture, so looking at his relations, if Odin married Frigg, whose dad is Fjorgen, who might be the sex swap Jord, who is Thor's mom, did Odin impregnate his father in law? Did I say that mythology is weird yet? Vili, god, son of Bestia and Bor, brother of Odin, might just be Odin wearing a false mustache to sleep with Frigg while in exile. Ve, god, son of Bestla and Bor, brother of Odin, might just be Odin wearing glasses to sleep with Frigg while in exile because everyone got wise to Vili. Frigg, god, wife of Odin, mother of Baldur, might also be Freya, but might also not. Frigg also plays fate like a fiddle, so don't mess with her or you'll friggin' regret it. Eh? Skathi. Jotun. Divorced Njorder. Couldn't handle beach life, so she ditched Njorder to head back to her ski lodge. No, seriously. Look it up. Njorder. God. Divorced Skadi. Father of Freyr and Freya. Skadi only married him because she thought he was Balder. 
Then he had two kids with his own sister, whose name we don't know, one of which might also or might not be Odin's wife. Ithan, God, wife of Bragi, the caretaker of the apples of immortality, which the gods eat to ward off aging and retain their youth. I say apples, but the Norse word epli, uh, which was used to describe all kinds of fruits and nuts, because proper apples were unknown to Scandinavian cultures during that era, so it probably wasn't an apple. We have no idea what it was. Yarn Saxa. Jotun, daughter of Aegir and Ran, one of the other nine daughters of uh, the ocean that was the mother of Heimdall, slept with Thor, mother of Magni. One of the nine sisters that personify the waves, which birthed Heimdall, the whole Thor Magni thing might have also been Sif and not her, as mythology is confusing. Thor, God, son of Odin, stepbrother of Loki. Again, we know a ton about Thor thanks to pop culture. So instead, I will say this Thor would regularly use his hammer to kill the goats that drove his chariot, eat them gather their bones and hides, bless them goaty remains with his magic hammer of many uses, bring the poor beast back to life so they could drive his chariot again, just waiting for the next time he feels peckish. I have now found the saddest existence of all time, ever. Sif, God, wife of Thor, mother of Thruth and Modi. Loki once cut off her golden locks as a prank, which pissed Thor off to the point of fratricide, until Loki calmed him down by tricking dwarves into making strands of literal golden hair so real they would grow out of Sif's head. Hother, God, son of Odin and Frigg, a blind archer who, granted he was tricked by Loki, shot and killed Baldur with a sprig of mistletoe. Odin, being a reasonable man, then immediately impregnated another goddess named Rinder, who then promptly popped out Vali, who grew into an adult in a day and straight up murdered Hother. Cool prank, Loki. Bragi, god, son of Odin and Frigg, husband to Ithan, a poet and a coward who somehow still gets to chill in Valhalla. Baldur, god, Son of Odin and Frigg, husband of Nana, father of Forseti. Basically the perfect god, so good-looking, charming, and happy that he literally radiated light. Due to his helicopter mom, he was basically invulnerable, except for that sprig of mistletoe that got shot through his heart. I wonder if he can brighten up hell. Nana, god, wife of Baldur, mother of Forseti. When her radiant hubby dies of twig sprig to the left ventricle, Nana says, me too, and dies of a broken heart, pretty much on the spot. Gerther, Jotun. Wife of Freyr. Yeah, wife's in quotes. Story's a bit off. As mildly as I can put it, Freyr thought she was hot. She thought he was not. He got a love potion and tricked her into drinking it. The end. Freyr, god, son of Njordr, husband of Gerther. To not dwell on the disappointing way he spent his romantic endeavors, Captain Manly Should Have Worn Pants had a boat called Skidbladner, say that five times fast, that always had the best wind and could fold up to fit in his pocket. Would it blow dry his jacket while stowed? Freya, god, daughter of Njordr, wife of Othar. Might or might not also be Frigg, but whatever. I feel like I'm repeating myself. Am I repeating myself? Fre I mean, Freya is the caretaker for the closest thing Norse mythology has to a heaven analog. Folkfogner, no, that isn't a car brand. It's the garden where the other half of the people who were slain in battle went that couldn't slip a 20 to the bouncer at Valhalla. Othar, god, husband of Freya, 
little is known about this god, and it is speculated he might be Odin with a new passport posing as a Vanir. He once went AWOL without telling anybody where he went, which caused Freya to cry literal tears of gold. Probably hurt, but I bet she could afford the medical bills. Magni, god, son of Thor and Yarnaxa, at three days old. This child of the thunder god could fully speak and was stronger than literally everyone else. Thor was stuck under a giant's foot that no one else could move, but this friggin' Totter god yeeted it aside and was just like, I got you, Pops. Probably had a better beard than me, too. I'm not jealous, you're jealous. Thruth, god. Daughter of Thor and Sif. Married off politically to a dwarf against her will, and Daddy Thor wasn't too pleased as well. Before the wedding, Thor tricked the dwarf to stay up all night, and the little whelp turned to stone at sunrise. Wedding off, and Thruth went off to be a Valkyrie. Modi, god, son of Thor and Sif, a buff berserker, gets to inherit Mjolnir when Daddy Thunder and the giant Sneck cuddle up for the forever nap after the most epic Ragnarok concert. Uller, god, son of Odin and Sif. Wait, what? Stepson of Thor. There are hints that Uller once voyaged across the ocean upon the back of his shield, but the actual story which tells of that has been lost to the ages. Tyr, god, might be the son of Odin. A god of war, aren't they all though? And justice. He let the big doggy Fenrir use his right hand as a chew toy so the other gods could collar it until the last big fight at Ragnarok. That is getting brought up a lot. Mimir, Jotun, brother of Besla, a god who got turned into a magic eight ball. He got beheaded in a student exchange program between the rival schools of Aesir High and Vanir High. Odin kept the head preserved on a keychain so Mimir could gossip about the rest of the Nine Realms. And for Seti, God, son of Baldur and Nana. Well, this one's weird. He's kind of a thrown in God by a historian for tidiness, but might just be the godification of the king, which was the Scandinavian judge or law speaker. So he was like kind of a model example for them. Want to be a good law speaker? Be like for Seti. Beyond. We got places. We got people. Now for some things. Tools and weapons that the gods used. Places that aren't entire worlds. Other things that I will never, ever be able to hope to pronounce. This list shouldn't be nearly as long as the list of characters, but should still be interesting. Yggdrasil, Cosmic Super Tree, the sacred tree which holds the nine realms, a dragon with a bottomless stomach, a big ass birdie, and some deer. Super important. Much wow. Gungnir, Weapon, the spear of Odin that uses aimbots when thrown. Glepnir, Tool, the thing that binds Fenrir until Ragnarok is a chain that isn't a chain because it can't be a chain since Fenrir can break any chain, so they made a chain that is a ribbon comprised of things that are impossible to exist. Since it can't exist, Fenrir can't break free. Anyone else have a headache? Mjolnir. Weapon slash tool. This Swiss Army hammer can smash, electrocute, resurrect, even bless. The only thing it can't do is shave Thor's magnificent face mane. Skidbladner. Tool. This ship of Freyr's was so big it could carry every single god in full armor plus all their weapons. And they were Norse gods, so just imagine how many weapons they brought to war. But could fold up like a cloth for easily losing it in the rest of your luggage. Now where did I put that god-ferrying mega yacht? Hofud, weapon, Heimdall's sword, 
At Ragnarok, he uses Loki as a sheath. Hofid literally translates to head. Heimdall's sword is called head. Gjallarhorn. Tool. A horn used by Heimdall and Mimir, but very differently. Mimir used it as a goblet to drink from first. Thank God the drinking came first. Then, Heimdall used it as a breath-powered air raid siren that all nine realms could hear at 3 a.m. Levatine. Weapon. This is most likely a magic staff, think Gandalf, made from the mistletoe that broke Baldur's heart. Loki is so nostalgic to make this weapon keepsake. Valhalla. Place. A giant Asgardian bar full of PTSD dead people partying until they all get to experience a terrible permadeath because 99.9% .9 of them are not getting through Ragnarok. Folkwagner. Place. Died in battle but didn't get that invite to the Valhalla party? No worries. Come relax in this beautiful Asgardian garden. Full of PTSD dead people, enjoying tranquility until they all get to experience a terrible permadeath because 99.9% .9 of them are not getting through Ragnarok. Urtherbrenner. Place. Also known as the Well of Urther. A lake at one of the three routes of Yggdrasil and located among the Aesir. Three scary ladies, Urther, Verthandi, and Skuld, Hang out here and play dice with the fates of the universe. Virgilmer. Place. Another of Yggdrasil's roots hangs out here in Niflheim, where the liquid from a cosmic stag's antler springs forth all waters in the universe. Oh, and that spring is infested with snakes. Oh, and a dragon named Nithhogger, who inhales everything, including the dead, like Kirby after a century-long fasting. Minisbrunner, place, a well at the bottom of Yggdrasil's third route in Jotunheim. Odin traded an eye for a single drink, but that glorified keychain Mimir downed the stuff like it was going out of date. Bifrost, place, and tool, a burning rainbow bridge between Asgard and Midgard. We've seen enough of the Bifrost in pop culture, but never that it was on fire. That sounds way more epic. Gjallar brew. Place. Tool. The counterpart to the Bifrost. This covered bridge, thatched in gold, spans a river of friggin' swords called the Gjol in the underworld and is the only way into hell. Yep, just as epic as the Bifrost. I wonder why I can't stop thinking of heavy metal albums. I feel like I'm copying some of those clickbaity videos and saying something like, The eight stories everyone should know from Norse mythology. But I tried to grab some key tales that cover the basics from creation, which I covered at the beginning of this video, to Ragnarok. I have super summarized them, so think of these as the sarcastic cliff notes of the cliff notes. Odin, the One Eyed Wonder. Odin, like all bearded men from stories, wanted all the understanding in the cosmos, and the internet or even libraries weren't a thing yet. So he decided to try the next best thing and went to Mimisbrunner to get a sippy sip of that knowledge juice. Mimisbrunner is a well akin to a bar with a regular patron that is there so much that instead of having a drink named after him, the bar is named after him. In Jotunheim full of wisdom water, where the root of Yggdrasil makes it a good bench for Mimir. Mimir is to that stereotypical wise man on a mountaintop, as that wise man would be to a turkey in a rainstorm, thanks to him pretending to be a fish and basically breathing that smarty wawa. Odin hops on down to the tap of Telmishes and asks old Mimir, bruh, can the king get a cup? 
Amir just smiles and is all, sure, but it ain't free. Odin whips out his Viking wallet, thinking a few gold coins will do the trick, not realizing that this is the Old Norse version of Starbucks, and a venti half-calf of the special sauce costs half of Asgard. So he settles on a thimble taste tester for the pittance of one Odin eye. Odin lost an eye, but gained wisdom. I wonder how he will roll on his next perception check. Loki brings presents so Thor won't kill him. Loki, being the dit, mischievous prankster that he is, decided that it would be a grand idea, and not at all a death sentence, to nair Thor's wife Sif in her sleep. Sif woke up bald. Thor woke up pissed. Loki was laughing like a giddy toddler until Thundergrip grabbed old Captain Oshiz's neck and threatened the solidity of every individual bone in his body. By name. In alphabetical order. Loki, as quick-witted and self-preserving as ever, makes a deal with his vain brother, saying, Trust me, I can make this all better, or I'll be your goat. Poor Thor's goats. Thor agrees, and Loki sets off on his amazing quest. Down to Svartalheim went our god of YouTube prank videos, for he commissioned from the dwarves many a marble. Iron Man and Cap, wait, no, wrong marbles. Sif's new hair of gold, real metal gold hair that would actually grow from her head once attached, that her neck muscles gotta work out after that. Skidbladner, the best boat that doesn't understand the concepts of size and had one of those hippie engines that the government doesn't want you knowing about as it doesn't need fuel and it runs on water, man. Gungnir, the leet spear of cheating McHaxer, so perfectly balanced that a toddler with no arms could throw it and the spear would still hit its target. Loki then bet his own head that some brother dwarves couldn't build some shiz to match those that I just listed, so they made Gullin Bursty, a living boar of glow-in-the-dark gold that didn't know you couldn't run in air or water, or that it shouldn't be able to beat a horse. Well, I'm not telling the probably radioactive super pig that it's wrong. Drop near, a golden ring that photocopies itself eight times every nine days, absolutely violating any and all laws of conservation of matter, a physicist's nightmare, and pawn shop's absolute dream. And Mjolnir, an electric-powered boomerang with the same aimbot as Gungnir, all in the handy-dandy shape of a short-handled warhammer. Loki yoinked them treasures and skedaddles back to Asgard, presenting the hair to Sif, the hammer to Thor, the cheaty spear and ring of I'm rich, bish, went to Daddy Odin, and Freyr got Bodhi McBoatface and the nuclear boar. The super dwarf bros popped into Asgard, demanding Loki's cranium as a decoration for their mantle, but Loki played semantics and pointed out that he promised his head, but not his neck, which they would need to hack in order to claim their prize. Everyone in the room shared a look, collectively rolled their eyes, and contented themselves with sewing Loki's mouth shut. All in all, a pretty good day. A wall, a shady deal, and a messed up horse. Asgard, being kinda constantly at threat from Jotunheim, was in need of some defensive upgrades. One day, this unnamed Jotun shows up with a named horse. Svadalfari. Translates to unlucky traveler. How sad that your horse gets a name and you don't. And says, I work for ADT, and have we got a deal for you. He boasts that he can build the best of walls around Asgard in three seasons, for the low, low price of the sun, moon, and that fine goddess's Freya's hand in marriage. All the gods are super ready to just yeet this Jotun off the Bifrost, but Loki, of course Loki, convinces everyone that if they only give him one season, there'd be no way he could finish the wall. Dude agrees and gets to working. Much building. Such wow, that horse dough. Svadalfari be doing twice as much work as that Jotun, and he ain't slouching. As the deadline grows closer, it looks like the wall was going to get finished. Freaking out, the gods all look at Loki to fix this predicament, as he had gotten them into it all with his convincing charm. Not wanting his skin decorating the halls of Odin's study as a rug, Loki went out for a stroll. On the last day before the deadline, all that was left was the main gate. The confident Jotun and Svadalfari went out to start work, 
but on their way, they passed a tasty-looking mare that got Svadalfari all hot and bothered. The animal ran off for some horseplay and didn't return until the following morning. Needless to say, the gate did not get finished. Thor paid the Jotun his alternative wage of a swift hammer blow to the noggin, and Loki did the walk of shame home with his son Slepnir, the eight-legged horse whom he handed off to Odin, hoping that he could just forget this night ever happened. Always a bridesmaid and never a Thor. One beautiful Asgardian morning, Thor awoke to find his most beautiful and valuable of possessions had been taken from him during his sleepy times. Mjolnir was not in its crib. Instead of sitting in the corner and having a good cry, Thor ransacked his house until he found a ransom note. If you ever want your hammer by your side, bring me Freya as a blushing bride. Love, Thrym. Knowing the gods, no one would give up Freya for any dumb old reason. So Thor called Loki to help him think of a sneaky way to get his beloved back from the Jotun chief. If you tell anyone about this, Loki, I will electrocute you until you cannot grow hair on any part of your skinny little body, threatened the distraught god of thunder after hearing of Loki's little scheme. Thor then donned a beautiful wedding dress, brought Loki as his bridesmaid, and went through with the wedding ceremony in Jotunheim, pretending to be Freya. Surprisingly enough, this worked out well, even to the point where Mjolnir was placed in Freya's lap in order to bless the wedding, per tradition. Bad move, Thrym. Off comes the wedding dress, and smash goes everyone at the wedding. Thor in dress leaves no witness. As the story is known, however, I'm going to take a stab in the dark and guess that Loki is the one who blabbed. Thor and Loki's Winter Wonderland Thor and Loki decided to go on a road trip through Jotunheim to find some adventure with Thalfi, their mortal errand boy. Riding along on Thor's chariot, pulled by two of the saddest goats I have ever heard of, the trio came to rest in a cave. Sleep eluded them, however, as their Jotun neighbor up the mountain was snoring so loud that the land shook. After waking up the humongous snore factory, he introduced himself as Skirmir and offered to carry their stuff for them and be their guide to the wonders of Jotunheim. The gods were like, yo, free taxi, and agreed. After a while of traveling, Skirmir got sleepy and took himself a little nap, but forgot to unlock his luggage where he had stowed all of Thor and Loki's goodies. With Thor and Loki getting hungry, they tried to get their stuff, but were locked out. Peeved, Thor did the only reasonable thing he could think of. He tried to brain Skirmir with his hammer. Skirmir's head was thicker than anticipated, and he barely felt the blow from Thor's super hammer. Forced to wait till morning, they made their way to the capital of Jotunheim, where Skirmir said, I'm like a fluffy cotton pillow compared to everyone else. Shiz nuggets, thought Thor. Once at the capital, Utthurger, the ruler of the Jotuns, Utthurger Loki, challenged the trio to some competitions to prove that the Asgardians were capital L losers. The boys agreed, as they ain't chicken. Round one, Loki vs. Logi. Eating contest. Who can eat an entire platter of meat first? They tied on time, but Loki ate the tableware as well. Result? Asgard 0, Jotunheim 1. Round 2. Dolphy vs. Hugi. Foot race. First to that tree in the distance. Wins. Hugi made it to the tree and back to Dolphy. Result. Asgard 0, Jotunheim 2. Round 3. Part 1. Thor's Drinking Challenge Drink everything from this horn goblet at once. Can he do it? He only drained the horn by a little bit of that salty beverage. Round 3 Part 2 Thor's Strunkman Challenge Lift Utthargas Loki's pet cat. Can he do it? Not a chance. Wait, what? Round three, part three, Thor's wrestling challenge. Beat up 
Scoot Tharga Loki's aged foster mother. Can he win? Well, he put up a good fight, but she kicked his butt. Result? Asgard 0, Jotunheim 3. But wait, none of that makes sense. I get that Loki not being a champion hot dog eater and a mortal losing in a foot race, but Thor getting his butt whooped by Granny and failing to lift a cat? What's up with that? Ah, well, magic, that's why. Skirmir was Utharga Loki the whole time, and illusions have been in play since I started telling the story. When Thor tried to crack open Skirmir's skull, he obliterated a mountain like a nuke on crack. Loki competed against a fire, which is why it consumed everything. Alfi raced against a literal font. Thor's drink was connected to the ocean, which he drained by a few meters. The cat, which was actually the giant snecky sneck, Jormungand, and the old woman was the personification of friggin' age. Thor went toe-to-toe with oldness itself and put up a decent fight. Utharga Loki then threw up the deuces and magicked his way out of there, knowing that Thor didn't have a sense of humor and would most likely try to bring about an intimate introduction between him and Mjolnir. Thor knew that drinking the ocean was impossible and beating time couldn't be done, but making the biggest snakeskin belt the Nine Realms has ever seen? Now that's a feat worthy of an arrogant thunder god. Cue the training montage of lifting and possibly larger chains. I don't know. The metaphor is getting away from me. Imprisoning the purely pernicious puppers. Fenrir, the doggy child of Loki and Angerboda, was raised in Asgard where he learned how to talk and grew big and strong. Such a good puppers when he isn't being, you know, absolutely evil. Well, a bunch of gods, including old one-eye Odin, had foretellings of the future where Fenrir was in need of the most epic of rolled-up newspapers to the nose. So they needed a way to lock the huge canine up. Doggo be smart, though. Kid of Loki, remember? So they challenged him to break the chains made by gods. And the Fenrir cub got all high and mighty and was all like, Muspelheim, yeah, I can break any chains you guys try to put around me, bish. While Fenrir was busy breaking lesser chains and those made by the gods, Odin commissioned the dwarves to make the best chain ever. And they sent him a ribbon. Pitterousness. Them dwarves are crafty and know what they're doing. Try it out anyway. They tied up Fenrir while he be laughing and crying. And when all was tied and ready, he starts to struggle and the pretty little ribbon stays tied and snug. Fenrir has been packaged like a porcelain ballerina. Odin finally reads the note that came with the ribbon, which stated, Be careful with this ribbon. This is not your everyday ribbon. This is not your box-up-a-birthday-present ribbon. This thing is friggin' impossible. Literally. It's made of the sound of a cat's footsteps, the beard of a woman, the roots of a mountain, the breath of a fish, and the spittle of a bird. Since it cannot exist, it cannot be broken. You tie something up in this, it is not coming untied. You can call it Glepnia. P.S. Do not use it as shoelaces. Do not ask how we know. While struggling against the prettiest of pink binding ribbons, Fenrir bit the hand that fed him for the last time. Literally, as he chomped and swallowed said hand of the god Tyr before getting hidden like the worst Christmas present on an island in Lake Amsvartner, until someone finally gets to open a very pissed-off gift from Ragnarok. You can only fail the will-this-kill-me test once. Balder was like that one guy in high school. You all know who I'm talking about. Had the looks, had the grades, the teachers loved him, The whole student body loved him. The parents loved him. The Greek gods wanted their kids to go to the Norse pantheon to become friends with Baldur. He was that awesome. But dear old Baldur started having some bad dreams, even though he slept with the lights on and his door cracked open. So Daddy Odin went asking a fortune teller what to do. And then he sent Mommy Frigg out to get every mofirous living thing and non-living thing 
the pinky promise that they will never, ever, ever harm their baby boy. Frigg goes out and does it. Like legit makes the whole friggin' eh, world promise not to hurt her beloved Balder. Now the gods have a new favorite pastime. Throwing stuff at Balder and watching it harmlessly bounce off. They throw rocks and sticks and cows and corpses and anything else they can think of. But what's a good story without some conflict? So in pops our good frenemy Loki. Disguised, of course, because who in their right mind would talk to Loki about any of this? Who asks Frigg, Yo, did you maybe, perhaps, I don't know, miss anything? Dummy dum dum Frigg actually answers, and she didn't ask Mistletoe, because it's just too dang harmless and innocent to ever do anything harmful to Balder. Off Loki goes to play some IRL Minecraft, where he makes a little spear out of Mistletoe. He then promptly returns to the party where they're still playing Huck Shiz at Balder. He then passes the Dart of Doom to Hother, blind god, saying, Hey man, you look left out. Here, chuck this shiz. Hother, excited to join the fun, lobs the dart and pegs Balder right in the chest. Like a key in a lock, and this key unlocks Balder's death. Shiz went nutso. After a hot minute, Frigg sent one of Odin's lesser-known sons, Hermod, to go see if Hel would let Balder come out from the land of the living for a permanent playdate. Nana, Balder's widow, said, There's no fish is out, and died on Balder's pyre, which Thor then zapped ablaze out at sea. And Odin speed ran a conception, birth, and raising of a kid with Rinder, who popped out Val. Vali grew up to adulthood faster than I could speed run Super Mario Bros. 3, and then sent Hother to visit Balder ASAP. Hermid made it to hell and asked if Balder can come out back to the living, because, you know, he's just too perfect to stay dead. Hell says, if everyone cries for him, he can go. Easy peasy, thinks Hermid. He pops back to Asgard and gives them the news. Everyone has a good cry. But Loki, dressed as some Jotun named Thok, says, nah, zombies are gross. So Balder stays dead, and Ragnarok draws closer. We will, we will, Ragnarok you. Most religious apocalypses have the silver lining of the chosen will get to live on in paradise. Not Norse mythology. They do brutal to the extreme. Even the dead aren't going to walk away from this, and existence itself is going to be torn asunder. Enjoy the ending of an age. Prepare for Ragnarok. Welcome to the end of the universe. I hope you brought your towel, and there is no in-flight movie. I would say that I hope your stay is comfortable, but I don't think that anyone is going to be finding comfort here. So let's see what misery awaits everyone. Much like Game of Thrones, winter is coming, and it will not be stopping anytime soon. Fenrir's kiddos, Skoll and Hati, have been chasing the sun and moon like they were cars on the highway. And here in Ragnarok, they'll finally catch their prize. Even the stars will go out at night, leaving the sky an inky void. Fenrir is going to get free of that pretty pink ribbon, and Jormungand will decide that he thinks land would make a better home than the sea. Loki will sail a ship full of dead and angry Jotun, and destruction will rain down on Midgard. Humans, welcome to death. The sky will crack open, and Muspelheim will peek through with the fire Jotun rappelling down to join the fray. Surtur and his flaming sword will follow that rainbow connection up to Asgard to connect his boot and their asses. Fenrir will eat Odin, but one of Odin's other random sons, Dathar, will do the stabby stab and endeth the doggo. Heimdall and Loki use each other as permanent sheaths for their respective swords. Similarly, Freyr and Surtur mutually remove themselves from combat by tuckering each other out indefinitely. Thor will show Jormungand what hammer time means, but will fall soon after his victory, realizing that the snake's favorite band was poison. During all of that, the forces of the dead from Valhalla, Folkwagner, and Hell are all fighting and re-dying, but this time into oblivion and not into an afterlife. And a big dragon named Nidhogger uh, is flying around and gobbling up all the dead and dying like they are free samples at the grocery store and he hasn't eaten in centuries. 
At the end, Vithar, Vali, Othar, and Baldur, back from the dead, and Modi and Magni get to live as the new gods, and two new humans, Lif and Lifthrother, get to repopulate the realm under a new son, the daughter of the old one, which I'm not really sure how that works. At least for the Ragnaroks that have rebirth. Now, obviously, this has been an extremely simplified and condensed version of Norse mythology. Is it wholly accurate? Probably not. Does it get the point across? I think so. Does it make you want to go out and find out more about what Norse mythology really entails? Well, that's entirely a you question. If you do want to go learn more, I have included in the description the sites I used for some of my research. I will fully admit that there is a ton more research that I could have done. But this was made as a fun side project, and I spent my off hours during a week to make this. And possibly more time than I actually should have, but you can't prove that. I also made a PDF document of this entire topic, which is also available in the description for download. Anywho, I hope you've enjoyed this little romp through an entirely sarcastic and generalized mythology of another culture that I barely understand myself. I sure as hell know I did. If you have any suggestions for what I should do next, or if you want to start a wholesome debate, leave a comment and I'll hopefully respond to every single one of them. Have a wonderful day.